to uh, introduce this and then I'll turn it over to um, Mr. Brooks. So um, this is our panel discussion on ballot measure two. We are fortunate to have as our moderator, James Brooks, who's a uh, frequent reporter for the Anchorage Daily News and in fact has written several excellent articles, including one this morning on ballot measure two. Um, certainly very knowledgeable about this subject. He's gonna be our moderator and um, he's gonna do the introductions. So I will turn it over to him. Well, good morning to everyone and welcome to the Alaska Law Review's conversation on ballot measure two, the Better Elections Initiative. As Ryan mentioned, I'm James Brooks, the state politics and government reporter for the Anchorage Daily News. And I'll be acting as moderator today. I'd encourage everyone watching on Zoom and on YouTube to ask questions as our discussion continues through the hour. Feel free to type your question into the chat window and the staff of the Law Review will text that question to me. If you're watching on Zoom, feel free to turn off your personal video stream so those watching in gallery view have a better view of the participants. And as for me, I always know I appreciate a Zoom call more when I'm not on video. But the goal of today's discussion is to give you, me, and the rest of Alaska a better understanding of the technical aspects behind ballot measure two and what could come up in litigation if voters approve the measure at the ballot box. To that end, joining me today are three panelists with extensive experience in Alaska law. Professor Ryan Fortson is an associate professor at the University of Alaska Anchorage Justice Center. Alaska's Alaska Law Review's co-sponsor for this conference. He will be providing both an introduction and the academic perspective of the issue. His research interests include Alaska native law, tribal courts, family law, and jurisprudence and legal theory. He received an undergraduate degree from Amherst College, a PhD in political science from the University of Minnesota, and a JD from Stanford Law School. He clerked for Chief Justice Dana Fabe of the Alaska Supreme Court. Representing the Yes on Two campaign is Scott Kendall, the group's legal counsel. An experienced litigator and appellate advocate, he previously worked as chief of staff to former Governor Bill Walker and worked on the reelection campaigns of US Senator Lisa Murkowski. Mr. Kendall attended Western Washington University for his undergraduate degree received his JD from the University of Washington School of Law and clerked for the Honorable Chief Judge of the Alaska Court of Appeals, Robert Coates. Providing a no on two perspective is former Alaska Attorney General Craig Richards. Mr. Richards was the 30th Attorney General for the state of Alaska, serving under then Governor Bill Walker. He is now a trustee for the Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation and has a long track record in corporate finance oil and gas, and tax law. Mr. Richards received his undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia, his JD from Washington and Lee University, and he has an MBA from Duke University. Following law school, Mr. Richards clerked for U.S. District Court Judge Ralph Beesline of the District of Alaska. And now just to run through some of the procedures we'll be following, each of the panelists will have 10 minutes to deliver opening remarks of their choosing. Then we'll have 20 minutes of questions for the panelists, and then we'll close with questions from our audience. And I'll try to reserve as much time as possible, especially if we get a lot of questions from you in the audience, because you come first on this. Again, post your questions in the Zoom or YouTube chat as they come up to you while our panelists are talking and I'll make sure that the law review gets them to me and I ask them to our panelists. So with that, Professor Fortson, please lead us off and, and walk us through the structure of this measure. Yes, so I'm gonna start uh, by providing a sort of a brief overview of measure two and um, the changes that it uh, seeks to implement. I do have some thoughts and comments, but I'm going to save those until after uh, the other presenters uh, present their uh, case because I don't want them necessarily to be uh, feel bound to respond to me. So there are really three key components to ballot measure two. Uh, there's campaign finance disclosure uh, changes. There's the uh, blanket primaries, and then there's ranked choice 
voting. Let me discuss each of those a little bit. There are also some other changes having to do with uh, the political power, the powers of political parties in Alaska, but those are mostly meant to uh, match what's being changed in the election process. So on campaign finance disclosures, uh, this is actually what the ballot measure leads off with if you look at the actual language of it um, and the justification. The goal here is to uh, reduce or at least expose dark money in campaigns, primarily money used uh, through political action committees. And what the measure does is it requires disclosure by both donors and recipients of contributions of more than $2,000 within 24 hours of its receipt. And it tries to trace the money back to what it calls the true source, which um, the theory here is that a lot of money comes from um, intermediaries, uh, from big money donors through intermediaries, and it's trying to trace the money back to these wealthy political donors. Um, groups receiving more than 50% of their funding from outside of Alaska would have to include a disclaimer on all of their uh, communications of this fact. And um, there can be up to a $1,000 a day penalty for not disclosing. So potentially pretty uh, substantial penalties. Uh, one thing to note is that this does not overturn Citizens United, it can't. So it's not placing limits on, um, on campaign uh, contributions, but it does seek to limit the effects. And as Professor Shem Shemerinsky noted, um, legally speaking, uh, disclosure is, is most likely going to be considered uh, constitutional. Um, there hasn't been a lot of public debate about the campaign finance uh, aspects of it. Most of it has focused on the changes in the election process. And uh, for those, again, we have blanket primaries. Uh, and the way this would work is all candidates would be placed in a common pool. Um, you wouldn't have separate primaries for each party. Anyone could vote in each in this uh, blanket primary, and the top four vote getters would advance to the general election. Um, even if, for instance, one uh, candidate got above fifty percent, so it's not a sort of like a runoff type system. Um, it's not. It's sometimes been called an open primary. It's not technically an open primary. An open primary is where you still have parties, but people, like if I'm a Democrat, I could vote in the Republican primary if it's an open primary. Um, this is a blanket primary. A closed primary, by contrast with the open primary, is where the party limits voting to its members in Alaska. Uh, currently, uh, the Democrat Party allows anyone to vote in their primary, so they have an open primary. The Republican allows, um, if you are unaffiliated or a Republican, you can vote in the Republican primaries. Um, legally speaking, both um, mandatory open primaries and mandatory closed primaries have been held unconstitutional at the US Supreme Court level in California Democrat Party versus Jones from 2000 and Tashjian versus Republican Party of Connecticut from 1986. Um, in Alaska, there's state versus last Democratic Party, which uh, Professor Shemarinsky mentioned uh, from 2018 held that parties could allow independents to run for their party's nomination, which um, has happened in uh, the both the US Senate and US House uh, races here in Alaska, along with several legislative races. Um, this blanket primary is really only used in Washington, the state of Washington. Um, it was held to be constitutional in Washington versus Washington State Grange versus Washington State Republican Party from 2008, a US uh, Supreme Court decision um, under the broad powers of states to regulate the manner of elections. Um, basically, the idea is that's a method of narrowing candidates. Um, the key here is that it, it's nonpartisan. Parties still have associational rights, but if you're just deciding how candidates can be narrow for the general election, that's acceptable. Washington has a top two um, method. There are no states that I'm aware of that have a top four. So this would be um, new to Alaska. Um, there are a couple of states that have 
blanket general elections and use runoffs. Um, Louisiana, for instance, does that unless one of the candidates gets above 50%. Georgia, Mississippi, and Texas use runoffs for special elections. Um, but this would be fairly unique among uh, election systems nationally. Uh, turning then to rank choice voting. So, so you have these top four candidates that go onto the general election. And then in the general election, you would get a ballot and you would have um, the option of saying, who is your first, second, third, and fourth choice um, of these candidates. And then if um, one of the candidates, so you have the election, if no one gets above 50%, then the votes for the bottom candidate are distributed. So that candidate is limited. The votes for that bottom candidate are distributed to whoever is the second choice listed. So it's not necessarily they would always go to the same uh, other candidate, whoever uh, voted for candidate, let's say candidate D is eliminated, whoever their second choice is would be, uh, would get their second choice votes and you keep going through that process until you get someone who is above 50%. Uh, in the United States, this is uh, at a statewide level, it's only used in Maine. And in fact, in Maine, it's only used for federal elections because the Maine Supreme Court has held that um, the state constitution allows for plurality victories. And so, um, so again, it has uh, limited examples nationally. It is used in several US cities, notably San Francisco and Minneapolis. Um, and ranked choice voting has also been used in other countries, has been used in Ireland, some form of ranked choice voting since 1922 and in Australia since 1918. Um, seems to have uh, been, you know, the people have kept the system, seems to have uh, worked reasonably well. Um, there, because it's somewhat of a unique system, there haven't been a lot of legal challenges. There have been some, well, pretty much wherever it's been implemented, there have been some legal challenges. None of them have risen to the US Supreme Court and um, all of them have been upheld as far as, as I'm aware. So, um, so that's my brief overview. Like I said, I do have some thoughts and comments, but I will save those until after the other presenters uh, go. So James, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Professor. We'll come back to you after our other two panelists have give, gotten the chance to give their introductions here. But uh, Mr. Kendall, you're up next. Yeah, thank you, James, and thank you, Ryan. Um, appreciate it and appreciate everyone's time. I'll try to be under 10 minutes so we can have more time for questions. Um, a little bit of background. Um, this ballot measure was drafted in Alaska by Alaskans um, to tackle our particular political problems. Alaska is at a crossroads. I think most people would agree. We have partisan fights that lead to late budgets, massive deficits, and gridlock in Juneau. Most people agree we want to have education, we want to have ferries, we want to have infrastructure, and yet year after year after year, we don't get solutions to these big problems. So we identified three problems um, that could be fixed with three simple reforms with Alaska's election system. Um, problems that create barriers, essentially, between the voters, the constituents, and their elected officials. So the first problem, a broken primary system. The second problem, winners without majorities in the general election. And the third problem being uh, the ever-growing uh, issue of dark money in Alaska's elections. So starting off with broken primaries, um, as Ryan discussed, Alaskans have to choose a party ballot. 62% of Alaskans don't belong to either major party, and yet when they go into the primary election booth, they have to choose either the Republican ballot or the what they call the Democrat and everyone else ballot. And to further the confusion, if you're an R, a U, or an N, you can take either ballot. But if you're a D, a G, an L, an AIP, or any other flavor of party, you can only take one ballot. So that leads to telling Alaskans, this election is not for you, it's for the parties. Turnout is incredibly low, sometimes around 20%. And worse still, that 20% turnout is divided to the two ballots. So yet again, now you've got 10% of the electorate showing up. And what we've seen, and we saw it in this, this most recent primary election, is you get incumbents who largely are believed to be doing the will of a majority of their constituents who are removed from office by five to 6% of their constituents. The five to six most ideologically extreme constituents decide the primary elections. And because of partisan redistricting, usually that decides who wins the general election. 
So 94% of Alaskans often shut out of the process and don't even have that choice on their ballot. The party primaries incentivize extreme campaigns instead of solutions. They punish, punish bipartisanship rather than reward it. Alaskans want to see bipartisanship, but boy, if you, if you dare to smile at someone from the other party, you're targeted to get primaried and taken out. So our solution is open primaries or what's called a top four or final four primary system. Every single candidate appears on the same ballot, regardless of party affiliation. Every single voter gets that same ballot, regardless of their party affiliation or lack thereof. You pick your favorite and the top four go on to the general election. Very simple and much simpler than the current two ballot system we've got today. Uh, another bonus to that system is we've seen around the country when you initiate open primary systems, nonpartisan primaries, turnout goes through the roof as much as 50% boost in the first year alone. Um, the second problem Alaska has, winners without majorities. Um, Alaskans typically aren't governed by majority winners. No candidate has won a majority of the vote for US Senate since 2002. Only five of our governors have actually been elected by a majority. So what happens is candidates run to their base and attempt to kneecap the other candidates they're negative campaigns instead of consensus solution campaigns. They know if they can muster their base and another candidate can strip a little bit of support, spoiler candidates can strip a little bit of support from their opponent, then they can win. They can win with 40%, 39%, or even lower. Um, and games have been played with this system. Uh, a Republican who's running against a Democrat knows that if a Green Party or an independent enters the race, they're going to harm their opponent. Likewise, a Democrat knows that if a libertarian or an AIP candidate gets into the race, they're liable to take a percentage away from their opponent as well. That's not more democratic, that's just games. So the solution we have is ranked choice voting, also called instant runoff voting. Um, instant runoff voting is another term used for it because it essentially functions, as some people are familiar with, with your local mayor's race, like the mayor's race here in Anchorage. If uh, everyone goes into one race, and if one candidate doesn't get the requisite level of support, the top two candidates move on and run off. Essentially, ranked choice voting does the runoff on a single ballot. So you select your candidates in order of preference, one, two, three, four. Um, different than other proposals in the country, our sp proposal specifically says if you want to vote for just one person, you can. And if you do, your vote will be counted exactly like it's counted now. So what you end up with is when the ballots are tallied, if someone re receives 50% plus one vote, they win, it's over. If no one does, the candidate in last place or fourth place, depending, is eliminated and all of their second place votes are assigned, uh, all of their uh, ballots are assigned to those voters second place votes. That process repeats up to two rounds, you know, eliminating the fourth, eliminating the third place candidate, just two rounds and you're guaranteed a majority winner every time. So the result is you end up with positive campaigns, not naive enough to believe everyone will love each other. Um, but at this point, are you incentivized to uh, attack your opponents entirely? Or are you incentivized to, to find the common ground because you would like to have their second choice support? Um, it's more competitive. Incumbents have to prove themselves and you have to have solutions-based elections. Uh, the result is, um, in, in, a, in locations where ranked choice voting has gone into place, people are more satisfied with their government, their government is more functional, and government becomes more representative of the population at large, both in terms of race and in terms of gender. All bonuses. Um, the final problem, uh, dark money. And dark money is sort of a term of art, but what it means is it's campaign spending that you don't know the real source of. And by real source, I mean the person or corporation that created the wealth, not an intermediary group. The way it works now under Alaska law, um, Alaska's campaign finance watchdog, APOC, has limited ability to inquire or peer through kind of a corporate veil. So if I, as a wealthy individual in Alaska, could decide I want to donate $5 million to influence the next governor's campaign, I donate that money to a low of 48 group called Americans for Apple Pie. Americans for Apple Pie donates it to Alaskans for Strong Families, and Alaskans for Strong Families donates it to a campaign group. That, the, that last name is the only name Alaskans see. So now you've got massive amounts of, of spending in elections, but that, that, that's a result of the Citizens United case. But the Citizens United case, when it allowed unlimited spending, also said specifically, 
that disclosure will be the disinfectant, that the voters will be equipped with who paid for it and they can weigh the, the speech um, accordingly. The problem is Citizens United, of course, blew a hole through 50 different states' disclosure requirements and Alaska hasn't quite caught up. It's been 10 years since Citizens United and this is, I think to most Alaskans, a welcome change. So what we do is we'd require the disclosure, and I won't go into it too deeply because Ryan did a good job, but essentially when you donate $2,000 or more to a super PAC or IE, or when you as a super PAC or IE receive $2,000 or more, you have to certify as to the true source, not an intermediary entity, but a donor or list of donors who are the actual source of those funds. And you have to report that within 24 hours to avoid the problem we have where round about December or January, once uh, the press has been able to go through tax filings of various entities, then they can say, oh, look, this is who paid for it. But of course, two months after election day is not good enough. Um, the other disclosure requirement is any group getting 50% or more of its funding from outside the state has to disclose that. Um, we think this is needed. These are needed adjustments to our election systems. It will put the public officials closer to their constituents. It will make them more accountable to their constituents. It will give voters more choices and better choices, and it will make government more responsive to the people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kendall. Uh, Mr. Richards, uh, your remarks, please. Thank you, Mr. Fortson, and uh, thank you, Scott, for your comments as well. Uh, first, I'd like to start by thanking the Duke Law Review for putting this on. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, it's my old alma mater. It's where I got my MBA. So I spent many, many a night in the Duke Law Library practicing law when I was getting my MBA and I grew quite fond both of the academic resources available there, but also some of the teachers and professors I had the chance to interact with. Um, and I also wanted to give a, a thanks to the Duke Law Review, uh, who has at least tentatively agreed to publish a paper I co-wrote with Bob Snuggeroff in the Springs version of the Law Review on uh, Alaska Native Corporation Settlement Trust. So everybody has the opportunity to dig into that, no doubt, fascinating piece of academic literature. I want to start by saying that unlike some people, I, I generally like direct democracy. I, I think the plebiscite in general is a positive addition to the traditional Republican form of government. And particularly with referendum and initiative, I think they serve not only a useful place in our country in general, but I think they serve a very useful place in Alaska where we have, I believe, a demonstrated issue with special interests having undue influence at times on our legislative and executive branches. It gives people a right to bring things directly to the ballot to the people to vote when maybe the legislature is gridlocked for special interests or other reasons and unwilling to do so. So the idea of initiatives in and of themselves being bad is not what I'm with, but ultimately I think we have to decide when we look at any particular plebiscite, whether or not it's a good one. So you have to judge the initiative on its individual merits. And I, I would assert in this discussion that ultimately the sponsors of the initiative and the particular change, particularly one that proposes radical change to our election system like this one does, they carry the burden of proof to demonstrate a few things. The first is to demonstrate that there's a problem that needs to be fixed. You know, the, those that advocate revolution need to demonstrate a revolution is necessary. The second is I think you have to demonstrate that the solution is actually better than the status quo. And I think at least in the context of this particular initiative, it's very helpful to look at who's really behind and advocating for the change. So let's jump into those because I think the, the burden of proof analysis is a useful framework. Um, Mr. Kendall, which I appreciate, did start off with just the idea of what is the harm? What are the harms he was trying to solve? And the first one he said was, was broken primaries um, that resulted in uh, what he viewed as inoptimal candidates. Well, I have to take a disagreement with that. I, I have to take a disagreement in the sense that one, the fact that we have political parties that select candidates that don't reflect people that aren't a member of the party, I don't believe that's problematic at all. I believe it's a matter of association rights for the party to choose their own candidates. I um, mean, I'm certainly not uh, sympathetic to the argument that some well-respected Republicans that got thrown out this last time incumbents, uh, that that was a bad outcome. Um, you know, this is America, throwing the bums out is as American as apple pie. 
And in this context, we've got a legislature is very divided and the core base of, of at least one of the parties didn't like the approach that a lot of the party was taking. So we had a lot of change. To me, that reflects you know, a working a working party system, certainly not something that we need to redesign our election system to fix. And one step farther, I, I don't even think you can look at Alaska practically and say that we have an overly divisive primary system that's resulting in candidates that are out of the norm or out of the margins. And in fact, just the opposite. I, I think we probably have election outcomes that are as democratic and non-party mechanic as you're going to get anywhere. Um, you know, we've had Wally Hickel was a member of the Alaska Independence Party. Bill Walker ran and won as an independent. Sarah Palin ran as an anti-establishment candidate and, and did very, very well against the party machine. We have an independent speaker of the House, Bryce Edgman, Bryce Edgman a very good man. Um, who has overseen a body that often has independent members. Um, Dick Randolph was, I believe, the first libertarian ever elected in the state. Um, and as we all know, Senator Murkowski ran a write-in campaign and was the first senator elected in write-in since Strom Thurmond in 1954. And Senator Murkowski, like many legislators in the, the modern history of the Alaska legislature in both bodies, the House and the Senate, have served and do serve in, in uh, non and bipartisan coalitions. It's very common in the state of Alaska that either our House or our Senate, based upon the particular makeup of the individual members, organize on a nonpartisan basis. And that's fairly unheard of in America, too. So the idea that we're overly partisan or we're overly divided or we're standing outside of the norm of how politics operates in America to the point that we need to change our election system, I don't think is right. I, I think we have a demonstrated um, good nonpartisan action. Uh, Mr. Kendall also pointed out that winners, that one of the other harms is that we have winners without majorities. Um, again, I don't even see that this is a harm that needs to be solved. There's, there's nothing inherently special about uh, having elections decided by majorities. There's nothing wrong with having three candidates and the candidate that gets more than the other two wins. And in fact, our Alaska Constitution, Article 3, Section 3 and Section 8 specifically provides that that's exactly how the governor and the lieutenant governor are to be selected. They rejected a majority system in favor of the most votes win system. And then finally, Mr. Kendall, Mr. Kendall points to the harms of unsourced contributions. Well, it's pretty hard to argue against campaign disclosure. Uh, you know, who doesn't want to ultimately know where money comes from that affects our political outcomes in our elections? I would just point out, and in this particular case, and I'll discuss this a little bit later, uh, the mechanism that they chose where you have 24 hour 24 hours to basically source the money all the way back to its origin uh, at the cost of very heavy fines. It, it's impractical and it's burdensome. And Alaska already has very difficult to comply with APOC rules that make it hard to run races in this state. And I, and I believe that there are simpler, better ways to have gone about true sourcing of funds than sort of this punitive extra layer of APOC bureaucracy. So, as I've said, I don't really think that any real harm has been demonstrated that needs to be solved, particularly as to there being some fundamental problem with Alaska not having bipartisanship in its political processes. Um, but even if there was a harm that needs to be solved, I, I think the burden of proof again falls on the initiative sponsors to demonstrate the solution is better than the status quo. And in this case, I don't think they've done so. You know, this, this initiative is 25 pages, it's 75 sections, it's incredibly complex. Um, in this debate and every other one I, I watched last night in preparation, people blow over entire changes to our disclosure system and the way political parties like appoint members to the Board of Elections and to APOC and other things that alone would normally an initiative be a major point of discussion. But because this bill is so complex and log rolls in together so much, we don't even discuss a lot of the other fundamental changes it's making to our system. And when I did the sectional on this, it, it took me almost an entire day. And although I don't know this area of law, absolutely, I've, I've you know, not practiced in election law exclusively. Um, I, I do know it somewhat, and this is complex stuff, and this bill is complex. And I don't think that our system thrives, our election system thrives in complexity. I think it thrives, particularly the, the franchise in general, it thrives in simplicity. And in two areas that I'll talk about here in a little bit, I think this bill, intentionally changes simplicity to complexity to achieve political outcomes favor to its sponsors. And that's in the top four choice uh, open primary and in the 
uh, ranked choice voting theory. And ultimately, when we look at whether or not the solution is better than the status quo, um, the, both the top four primary and the, the ranked choice ballot measures, I, when I read this, I immediately thought to myself of something I learned when I was at Duke, when I took microeconomics at Fuqua, was the concept of game theory. And I don't mean game theory like playing Monopoly or this is a game who fun. I mean, in the classical economic sense, the John Nash sense of a theoretical system that is re-optimized to achieve optimal outcomes for some of the participants and the players. And that's what this is. You have a situation where you have several billionaires from out of state, three in fact, who've donated over $5 million, 99% of the funding of the group that's for this comes from out of state, to essentially redesign a working election system in a model that they think will create better political outcomes for the candidates and the types of candidates they prefer. They're completely rewriting our one person, one vote political system because big, rich outside donors think Alaska's elections will be better if the candidates they prefer got elected. So I'm running out of time here. So let me just say that in particular as to ranked choice voting, which is certainly in my view, the most pernicious part of this bill is that think about what it does. It basically says rather than everyone going into the general election and getting one vote and your vote being counted, we're going to play a game. We're going to use a computer array to systemize what your vote really means. And we're going to do that because we want to change outcomes. Well, the study done by the University of North Carolina, Wilmington and Ohio State University found in other jurisdictions that have ranked choice voting, there aren't many, but there are a few enough that you can get statistical samples. We, um, we are at 10 minutes now, so. Okay, maybe. I will finish very quickly. Um, it found that 10 to 27% of voters votes end up ultimately not counting because they don't vote all the way down the line on the ranked choice, so their vote gets thrown out. So I would just suggest to conclude that our system works. It's the traditional American system. Everybody votes counts. And there's no reason to re-optimize our voting system so that outside billionaires can get candidates they want elected. Thank well, you. Thank you to all three of you. And for our audience, if those opening remarks sparked any questions, type them in the chat. The Alaska Law Review will forward them to me and I'll ask them of our panelists. And Professor Fortson, you had mentioned earlier that in your research on the academic side, you had come up with some questions as well. And yeah, I so bring those up. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I have, I'll try, I'll try to be brief because I want to make sure we leave plenty of time for questions from the audience. But I do have a, a few thoughts. Um, and, and when I approach this from an academic perspective, I try to look sort of at the tension between the theory behind these uh, proposed changes and the practice. And so, for example, to start off with campaign, the campaign finance disclosure requirement. So the Center for Responsive Politics uh, did a study and they said that in, in sorry, 2018, there was $852 million spent by super PACs on elections. 1% of donors gave 96% of that money. And so there is, you know, certainly I think a case can be made that there's a problem with this. I, I think the enforcement, though, of, especially of the true source provision of the ballot measure is going to be quite uh, complicated, as Attorney General Richards noted. Um, there seems to be sort of an assumption of direct traceability uh, with this money, but I think a lot of times the, the original donors may not be earmarking it for Alaska, but they may be giving to this intermediary group, which then may make decisions about how to spend the money. And if that ends up being the case, then actually sort of tracing it back to the source um, might be challenging. Um, and then you're also sort of expecting, you know, the reason why they go through these intermediaries is they don't want their names associated with uh, particular causes. And so you're going to get a lot of litigation, a lot of roadblocks. The idea that this is going to be resolved in 24 hours, I agree, is, is problematic. Um, and and the Professor Fortson could. could I'd like Mr. Kendall to address that if he could. Um, yeah, that, that's fine. I do have other comments, but if we want to um, address that, that, that's my comments on the campaign finance disclosure. And then I do have comments on Blakey primaries and ranked choice voting as well, but go ahead. Uh, Mr. Kendall? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and there's some great points there and it's important to distinguish. We're not talking about candidates um, accepting donations, candidates for local office, candidates for school board. They get their donations, those come under the limits and those are given by individuals or groups that
that you easily identify. So this is about super PACs and independent expenditure groups getting $2,000 or more. So if you're saying a super PAC can't be bothered to say to their donor, you've got to tell me who gave you this money before I can accept it. And that a sophisticated donor who's throwing around thousands or even millions of dollars can't go fill out accurately a form on APOC that probably takes 90 seconds, then I just don't think that's where the public is at on this. Um, the issue is a burden. The burden is truth. So an entity would have a couple of um, options. And with respect to earmarking, um, I think I've seen numerous investigations, litigation and otherwise, that shows the idea that these donations are not earmarked is just not the case. Um, wealthy billionaires do not give $10 million into a group on a wish and a prayer and a hope that it lands somewhere in some state that they care about in some race that they care about. They absolutely do earmark these donations. So the group that is giving money to the ultimate campaign entity here in Alaska has two choices. Well, three choices. Choice number one is to say, I don't wanna disclose. Well, keep your money on the other side of the border then. They don't have to. That's not repressing speech, that's just disclosure. They can decide whether to comply. They can decide whether to allocate the donation to their donors, a donor or donors um, that amount to the donation, or they can simply say, here's a link to all our donors. We can't, you know, we, we get in enough money that we have to aggregate it, but here's our, here's our 28 donors or our 38 donors or our 100 donors, but here's what they give. Because right now all we've got is a brick wall with no disclosure at all. And saying, you know, a nearly $1 billion problem is something we need to ignore because we shouldn't try. I just disagree on that. I think it's possible and the burden goes on the donor. And Mr. Kendall, could you explain the limits of the disclosure? My understanding is that it would not apply to federal races. Is that correct? And would not apply to ballot measures as well? That's correct. So it can't apply to federal races um, because we have the FEC and that's federal preemption. So although Alaska controls how the election of its federal delegation occurs, they control the election system, they cannot control campaign finance. They've been preempted out of that field entirely. And you know, the Citizens United decision also provides this wall that they can't actually prohibit the donations. Um, what was the other part of the question again? And ballot measures as well are not covered by it? Yeah, ballot measures are actually uniquely separate from candidate um, contributions because candidate contributions, were, we were always allowed to have limits, always you know, it, prior to Citizens United, because of the thought that money could corrupt. We were never allowed to have um, overt limits on ballot measures. So there's a whole separate disclosure regime because the thought being you can pick up a ballot measure, you can read it, it means what it means. You can't corrupt it. Um, that being said, um, another measure to provide more disclosure on ballot measures I think would be equally welcome. It's just a whole separate statutory regime that would require a whole separate uh, uh, kind of line of attack. And Professor Fortson, I'd like to you to ask your next question. Yeah, know. so, um, yeah, and, and I'll just sort of follow up on uh, Mr. Kindle with regard to ballot measures. I, I, I agree that as long as Citizens United and speech and money are associated, you know, something where there's no sort of direct link is going to be tough to, to regulate. Um, yeah, so on, actually, I'll combine the ranked choice and um, uh, the blanket primaries because I think they're sort of combined in in theory. Um, so on the uh, the blanket primary, so what I did is I looked at the uh, primary election this year for Senate District N, for example, as a way of illustrating this. This is Kathy Giesel. Uh, when her, her district, um, she lost in the primary to uh, Roger Holland, who I think um, most people would, fair, would be fair to say is um, more conservative. The theory behind why you want um, more open primaries is that in practice, it tends to be that more partisan um, voters participate in primaries. And, um, and that's the primary election turnout is much smaller than the general election turnout. The primary voters, again, tend to be, you know, even putting aside the party affiliation requirements for voting, they tend to be the more partisan um, members of their party and therefore may take positions. This is not uniform, but I think there's a, sort of a fair association. They may take positions that are more associated um, 
less with moderate positions and more with um, further to the ideological uh, boundaries of their respective party. So, um, so uh, Ms. Giesel, Senator Giesel um, lost the percentage wise, she lost by a fair number of percentage. The number of votes was about 1500 votes because the turnout was relatively small. Um, on the Democratic side, you had a very uh, much closer election, about uh, 300 votes separated the two Democratic candidates. Um, if you had a top four, um, and there were only four candidates for the two parties, if you had a top four election, then kind of the primary wouldn't really matter. All four of those would advance. There is in the general election a petition nominee. Petition nominees wouldn't be allowed under ranked choice voting. Um, and so it can be hard enough in legislative races to recruit candidates for parties. There are several legislative races that are essentially uncontested either within a party or even within the general election. You may, there are some candidates that are running without any opposition. Um, so I'm not sure to the extent, at least- what, for what's, extent, your, what's your question, Professor Fortson? But the question is, is this necessary? Do we need this, at least on the state legislative level, do we need rank choice, uh, sorry, the, the top four voting to, what would it really accomplish? And I'll throw that out. I do have thoughts on rank choice voting. If we want to address this now, I, we can hold off on the rank choice voting for a minute. Mr. Kendall, did you follow that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've got sort of an answer. I, I think the, the root of the question is why have this top four primary, I think. Um, and, and really, um, an important distinction there, he said, well, petition candidates won't be allowed. That's incorrect. Petition candidates will now be treated equally. So if you have a U or an N next to your name, you get to go on that primary ballot, something you've never been able to do. You know, a typical petition candidate complains that no one will pay attention to me until after Labor Day because no one knows I exist. So this just levels the playing field. So, But, the, um, but they would the, not be allowed to enter into the general election directly. That would just be the primary. Yeah, everyone goes into the primary, but they don't have to have party status to do so, which they do now. And of course, some minor parties go on to and off of having ballot access. Right now, I think only the AIP has it. Libertarians and Greens are shut out and have to do the petition process. So everyone gets on the ballot. So that's the first point. The second point being, um, you know, maybe the, the, the implication being sometimes we're not going to have more than four people. Well, right now we've got multiple public officials who had no challenger in the primary and no challenger in the general. They still show up on the ballot. Um, but this system can take more. And certainly when you break down the barriers and you stop allowing the parties to be the gatekeepers to the ballot, more people are going to run, more people from that 62%. And I guess um, I'll just read you some numbers because I think these numbers are why we need it. 65% of legislative seats are held by Republicans in Alaska. 24% of Alaskans are Republicans. 33% of legislative seats are held by Democrats. 13% of Alaskans are Democrats. 2% of legislative seats are held by an independent or an other. 62% of Alaskans are an other. The system doesn't represent the people or who they are. So this just breaks down the barrier and says, whoever you are, whatever kind of candidate you are, show up. And if you can, if you can muster the support to be in the top four, then we'll see you on the general election. And Mr. Richards, I'd like to turn that over to you because that was something you had brought up that the existing system works and I received a question from the audience as well that asked what Mr. Kendall just said. He said 63% of voters are not registered Republican or Democrat, but there's not 63% of the legislature that's independent or, or third party. So I'd, I'd put that to you. Um, so I, I guess ultimately it comes maybe from the point of view that you take it is do we have a strong party system or don't we? And people tend to run through the party systems because that's the way you, you get funding and you get on the ballot early and get known by your party. And, and without the momentum of, of the primary race, it does get hard to get elected as an independent. So that's why one of the changes where independents can now be on the Democratic ballot is at least helpful in that sense. It does give people that are independents a little earlier access. What I wanted to say about the, the top four ranking choice is that when I first read this bill, I thought it was going to be going to create an open primary in the classical way that I think Alaskans think about an open primary. That is, you get one ballot and on that ballot are a bunch of different parties with a bunch of different candidates and you vote for whichever candidate you want and the candidate within that party that gets the most votes goes on to the general. 
This is not at all a classical open primary system that's proposed here. Instead, the four people that get the most votes, regardless of party, goes on. And I think that, again, this is a situation where the, the proposed cure is substantially worse than the status quo. You're going to end up under the top four system where weak parties will, even if they can get, the, get on the ballot, will often not be able to get on the general ballot, like the Green and EIP candidates, because you know Democrats and Republicans will occupy most of the voting slots. So these smaller parties are going to get disenfranchised and off the ballot in the general. You're going to end up where you have some races where you have all Democrats or you have all Republicans that go to the general even. And, and you're going to have a, a situation where, um, you know, it's not even going to be possible for people to vote for one of the major candidates. Um, and then you're going to end up in really goofy situations when it's combined with ranked choice voting, where you have, for instance, I live in downtown Anchorage. You know, you could have two very strong Democratic candidates and one maybe not a strong Republican candidate. All three of those could advance and you could have weird ranked choice voting outcomes where, you know, a Republican wins in downtown Anchorage. Um, it's all a possibility under the way the math works. So again, I think if they had just gone with a simple open ballot, everybody gets to vote who they want and that party advances, that I probably wouldn't be here opposed to at least this portion of the initiative. But instead, they, they overreached and they, they created this game um, for purposes of really not just giving people more access, but manipulating outcomes. And Mr. Kendall, I'd like to ask you about something that Mr. Richards had raised earlier about how the Alaska Constitution deals with gubernatorial elections. Could you address that or do you need me to repeat that? No, I know what you're referring to, um, actually. So this arises, I believe, um, out of some conflation with the Alaska Constitution and the Maine Constitution. Um, but it's important to clarify from the get go the main constitution for those state races, the main constitution literally says the winner shall be decided by a plurality. That's what their constitution says. That's the limit they have to live with. Alaska's constitution is altogether silent about all legislative seats. It just says there shall be elections. With the governor, what it says is the, the winner of the governor's race shall be the candidate who gets the greatest number of votes. I think Craig would agree with me. That's, that's the language. Our ballot measure says the winner is the one who has the greatest number of votes. So after tabulation, they've got the greatest number. So we see no you know, overt or even implied conflict there. I understand that that's something that opponents have repeatedly raised, but um, you know, I'm a lawyer and I can, I can work with the best of them, but I think greatest means greatest. And, and Mr. Richards, would you agree with that? No, I mean, again, I like our system because ultimately the courts will decide. So until that happens, Scott and I are just both drawing our opinions here. But what the language says is that this is Section 3, Article 3. The governor shall be chosen by the qualified voters of the state at a general election. The candidate receiving the greatest number of votes shall be governor. So I read that on this plain face to say the guy that gets the most votes wins or the gal. Um, and, it's, and it doesn't say the, the greatest number with a plurality, it just says the greatest number. So it seems implicit to me that this has allowed a system where you don't need a majority. But again, Scott has a different read and, and I'm sure the Supreme Court will get to decide that one day if this passes. And Mr. Kendall, uh, there are other provisions of the state constitution that deal with the Lieutenant Governor's election and how does the measure approach that? Yeah, so one of the, I, I don't want to say peculiarities, but one of the things kind of written into the Constitution is that the governor and lieutenant governor are always elected as a pair. They don't have the option appearing on the general election ballot uh, separately. You, you get what you get. So the way it's worked in the old party system world was um, whoever comes in first as a Republican, as for governor and for lieutenant governor, well, there's the arranged marriage. Whether they like each other or not, that's who's running together. Same with the Democrats. The exception to that, of course, was petition candidates. Petition candidates essentially go out, they find a like-minded individual or they find someone who's got maybe complementary strengths and weaknesses and they run together. And so this system having to acknowledge that constitutional limitation says that governor and lieutenant governor teams have to form up essentially just like the petition candidates do now. Those candidates would choose one another. It's a little bit more like um, what we see in the presidential system where the, you, know, you have the, lead, the leader um, being the governor and they find a like-minded uh, person to run with, but that's required by the Alaska constitution. And Mr. Richards, did you have any thoughts on that? No, other than just to point out the same comment I made earlier that this bill is so dense and so complex and has so many moving parts 
that that change alone normally would be the subject of its whole debate. But in this particular bill, it is, you know, item 17 on the list of big changes. So it's just like many things, it's really getting these major policy changes are getting made without without the individual ones getting as much attention as, it, as at least I believe they they deserve because we're all focusing on you know ranked choice voting and the change in our primary system. And so, Mr. so Kendall, my, my view of having done this, and I've seen the same in oil and gas tax initiatives too, is if if I'm ever involved in initiatives in the future, I'm I'm going simple. I, I think complexity, uh, I think it hurts. I think it hurts the, the initiative a lot. And Mr. Kendall, this leads into a question that I got from our audience, and that, that was why put all three reforms into the same measure. Um, the the questioner asks, for example, I like the transparency provision, but really don't like the other two parts. And so why does my choice have to be whether to vote against the entire measure because I only like one part? Yeah, so I guess um, I guess I would start from the drafting perspective. So drafting wise, um, and I can say where I you know, individually started and, and several people worked on this, but we started with this idea that this closed primary system was kind of fundamentally undemocratic, particularly in a state like Alaska. So how do you fix that? Well, if you look at a top two system, you're probably gonna get a candidate from either party, or maybe in some districts you get just two Republicans and two Democrats, that doesn't reflect Alaska. So then you have the idea of this broader top four primary. That can't work, however, standing alone, because go to the general election, and now all of a sudden you've got, you know, perhaps the most extreme candidate gets 26%. 74% would have preferred any of the other three people, but this is what we get under the plurality system. So those two systems, and likewise, if you try to do ranked choice voting in the current system, well, you've got a party system that cuts off ballot access to everyone. You know, the AIP can get on the ballot right now, but the Green Party can't, Libertarian Party can't. And to the point of Mr. Richards saying it cuts off um, small parties, they've actually both endorsed ballot measure two because they see this as, this is the way smaller third parties get a seat at the table. Um, but you can't have just the ranked choice voting without the top four, because if you have two choices, what are you ranking? So those two pieces are sort of, inex they're, they're inextricably intertwined. One doesn't work without the other, or at least doesn't work properly. Then we kind of came to this, this realization as you go through and you see, okay, the parties are going to exist. They're going to endorse candidates, but they're going to take a step back. The, the parties aren't in charge of elections anymore. And a lot of voters who go to the polling booth and they rely on going straight D, straight R, which is probably something very few Alaskans actually do, but it's something some voters do. Um, what's going to be important to them now? In a post-party um, control world, they need information. And what they need is you know, good information quickly. And that's what, that's what the dark money provides. So this was sort of a, a package deal. Let's give the power to the voters. Let's actually equip them not only with the, the, all the levers to make all the choices they wanted to, to make, you know, giving them the, the selections they want on the, on the general election rather than having them artificially limited. But let's also give them good information so those are informed choices. And so that's why it's a package. Well, and, and you just said that it, it doesn't work properly if the two pieces aren't together, correct? What yeah. about presidential elections though? Because you'll only have ranked choice voting. You can't do a top four primary for presidential elections. Right, but you will have, um, you know, and, and you can't control that. The parties, um, the presidential primary system is a creature of the parties. And, they, and, and to their credit, they handle it themselves. They pay for it themselves. So that's their business. Whereas, you know, the conventional primary system, you and I or the state is paying for their, their selection process. But there will be more than, um, there typically, I think there might even been seven this year. So they, people will have the opportunity to rank it, but you won't have a distorted outcome where you've got the Democrat versus the Republican, or maybe there's a strong independent and someone, you know, perhaps the Republican and this independent are kind of closely aligned in views. 65% prefer one of them, but they divide their support so evenly that the Democrat wins, even though 64% of the people didn't want it. So again, it's going to function just fine. This is going to depend on the the selections that the national system serves up to us. Because again, that's one we don't control. And Mr. Richards, this, did you have any thoughts on the presidential side of things? Because I imagine this is one of those things that you would say would have gotten a lot of attention otherwise. Right, I mean, I would just say that this thing's gonna end up being piecemeal, right? It's not gonna apply to the presidential races or certain other federal races. 
I don't think it's going to apply to the election of the governor and the lieutenant governor because I think the Constitution says what it says. So we're, we're going to end up with just kind of a catch all system where, you know, the, the game designed by the, the outside guys applies to essentially our state representative races and our, and our Senate races, but they're not applying to sort of our at large elections. So, I mean, again, it just seems really like we're going to put the patchwork that, that, in my view, doesn't make a lot of sense. You, you think that the state courts or federal courts would would negate those elements? Yeah, on the governor and lieutenant governor race, I do. As Scott and I discussed, he obviously disagrees. And Professor Fortson, you had uh, an additional question. Yeah, well, I'll sort of leading in on the presidential race, um, right choice voting, for instance, you can think of, you know, everyone hates to go back to Bush v. Gore, but Florida, um, Ralph Nader got more votes than the, uh, the margin between Bush and Gore. And, you know, no one knows for sure, but I think likely a lot of those voters, if they had had a second choice, probably might have put Gore. And so a ranked choice voting system, had it been in place in Florida at the time, might have changed the outcome of US history. Um, but going back to the Senate uh, District N example, um, you know, I think that you will tend to have more moderate candidates, whether you think that's a desirable outcome or not is, is appropriate. But you might also have situations of um, gamesmanship. And I'm going to give you here an example of the San Francisco mayoral race in 2018, where you had basically three top candidates and two candidates. So you had the top candidate, but then the next two candidates co-endorsed each other and said, basically, if you don't vote for me, or, or basically put the other candidate as your second choice. And, um, and it ended up being that the top uh, candidate who started out with 36.7% of the vote ended up being the majority winner. The other two candidates had basically 24% each and they couldn't get enough second and third place votes to get in either one of them into the majority. But I guess my question is whether that gamesmanship is a bad thing or whether you see that as a desirable coalition building. Mr. Kendall? Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't, um, I don't necessarily see the, the gamesmanship involved because what you're asking is, is that outcome going to be more reflective of what the majority of voters want? Then yes, that's a desirable outcome. If you've got, you know, again, a three-way race and two of the candidates, you know, appear to cater to one um, sort of political view and they split that support, then, you know, the system's operating as it should when, you know, 55 or 60 percent support coalesces around what's essentially the majority view as opposed to, you know, the spoiler effect, which, you know, we've seen in Alaska, we've seen around the country, which is candidates can win with 34, 37, 38 percent support and 62 percent pre preferred something else. So candidates finding common ground and saying, hey, we agree on a couple of these solutions. I mean, I think that would be a refreshing change, um, not only in Alaska, but maybe around the country. And Mr. Richards, did you have any thoughts on that? Just that I, you know, I just don't share Mr. Kindle's view that the system's broken. I mean, when we talk about the system, we're talking about the American system to electing candidates that pretty much, you know, the whole country at state, local, and national levels follows with a few exceptions. So I, I just can't get my head around what is so broken about the American way of doing elections that we have to adopt sort of this game theory approach to optimize to the middle. Uh, because, you know, that's what some big rich guys in, in Texas and New York and California want. Our, our system works. It works well. And, and there's no reason to play experiment with people's franchise. And Mr. Kendall, what would be your response to that? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's this continued talk about an algorithm or game theory. Um, but I find it useful to kind of use examples to really talk about how this is going to work. So imagine you've got three candidates and there's 10 voters. Candidate one gets four votes. Candidate two gets four votes. Candidate three gets two votes. Here's what happens. You pick up those two votes and you look at their second choice and you put them in that stack. It's relatively simple. It's not an algorithm. Everyone's vote counts. Everyone's vote counts equally. And you know what's so broken, I guess that's the frame that, that uh, Mr. Richards put on it. I'll, I'll explain what's so broken. Um, the RLSC, the Club for Growth, Americans for Prosperity, dark money groups that poured hundreds of thousands of dollars into our primary and were able to sway outcomes 
which are now funding the opposition to this ballot measure because they want to continue that system. They want a system where the ideological purity in their eyes actually counts for more than what a majority of Alaskans want. And I think Alaskans are just sick of that. They're sick of the games, they're sick of the meddling, and they want a system that treats every candidate equally and every voter equally. And that's not what we have right now. And Mr. Kendall, could you talk about the drafting of this measure? Uh, Mr. Richards had talked about the financial backing of the, the yes on two group you had talked about how it was written in Alaska. And so how was it drafted? Yeah, so, um, you know, there was, I, gosh, I talked to dozens of people just about the problem. You know, before you get to the drafting phase, what are the problems? I talked to people, you know, as politically diverse as Bruce Patello on one end of the spectrum, Sheldon Fisher on another end, and everyone agreed, it's busted. This, you know, these results we're getting, and this is before the primary, of course, this is, you know, spring of last year people realize there's something wrong with the system. Everyone is so angry. The world's on fire. How do we fix it? So um, uh, primarily, um, I myself and uh, Libby Bacalar, who you heard from earlier, um, one of the state's leading um, attorneys, if not the leading attorney on election law, we got together and we actually grabbed two prior bills that had been filed in the legislature and no surprise had like gone and died in the committee somewhere because they weren't going anywhere. Um, and so we took those as kind of the starting point and we cobbled together um, this system from that. So it was a, um, you know, an open, a top two open primary, which means that to top four for reasons we've discussed. There was a ranked choice proposal. We adapted that to work with the top four. And that's, you know, that's really how it happened. We did not have um, outside dollar number one when we put this thing together. I can say that. Um, and just sort of much like venture capitalists, we said, hey, we think we got a good idea. We shopped it around both in state and out of state. Uh, we being me, not not Libby. She was involved in the drafting, but not this part. But um, and we said we think we've got a good idea, and folks have invested because they actually think, given how strong the system is, and given Alaska's um, rep well earned reputation for political independence, maybe Alaska can be a leader in the country, of having a really good system, that is more like you make decisions in real life. If I go to the car lot and I need a truck, and I go to the Ford lot and they're all out of F one fifties. I don't leave the lot in the Ford Taurus. I go across the street and I look at the Chevy trucks or the Toyota trucks. The idea that you have to support what you support and if you lose, you get the exact opposite. That's a broken system. A system where you can you know, acknowledge that people might have gradations of feelings. I might feel really strongly about social issues, but I might have different ideas about the finances of the state and vice versa. And acknowledging that political diversity is the only way we solve big problems. Mr. Kendall, how did you create the dark money provision? Because that was not in a, a previous bill. No, it wasn't. And that was one um, drafted partially based on my experience. I've, I've probably handled as many, uh, as many proceedings in front of the APOC as any attorney in the state. So it was based on my experience. And I also looked um, to a disclosure requirement they'd put in place in Arizona. And so that was where that came from. And then, you know, the, the outside money, well, that's a common complaint that Alaskans have. And the lack of timely filing, that's a common problem that I've seen the press have, where, you know, inevitably at the end of November or sometime in December, you know, here's a story about where all the money in that campaign really came from, but you guys can't keep up with it in real time. Um, that's, so that one's more of an original creation, is long story short. And did you have any candidates in or, or races in mind as you were creating this? I've heard uh, people critical of it calling it the Lisa Law uh, because... Lisa Murkowski might benefit from it? Um, you know, not really. Um, I've seen local state races where there's been a spoiler. I was obviously involved with Lisa's um, Senator Murkowski Rather's write-in campaign. And, you know, we saw some pretty high stakes issues there. We saw issues where suboptimally, you know, Senator Murkowski as the winner got 39% and Joe Miller got something close to 36%. Um, so we had issues where it wasn't because of, but it's those, those races, um, you know, Governor Walker's unity ticket, you know, the couple of independents we've elected here and there, those are the exceptions that prove Alaska needs a better rule. Alaska has kind of flexed its independence in spite of the system built around it to, you know, there's a reason why that was the only second of the, the only second, um, in the country successful writing campaign. 
because someone being able to take on both parties is almost unthinkable. So shouldn't individuals be on an equal footing regardless of parties? Uh, it seems like they should. The parties have an important role. They endorse candidates. Um, they support candidates. But should they control the elections? That's really the difference. And so, no, not any particular race, just a kind of symptoms of a disease that appears to be getting worse. And I'll have one final question from the audience here and then give you both a few minutes to wrap up, uh, two minutes each. Uh, the question from the audience is, it, if this is approved, would it be likely that non-Republican or more likely that non-Republicans and non-Democrats be elected? In, and is it a goal to move past the two-party system? And that's for Mr. Kendall. Actually, can I just um, interject here? Because uh, there have been some studies on on this, and the the studies didn't look at party affiliation, but the studies do seem to suggest that candidates with more moderate political positions would be more likely to be elected. Um, that may be independent. Like I said, the studies, at least I've looked at, don't look at party affiliation, um, but it, it, it does look like there's some evidence to suggest it would have that result. There's also some evidence to suggest that um, the races themselves become more civil, less contentious in part because of the, uh, the candidates want to attract second place votes and so they don't go as negative um, in comparison to uh, the current voting system. So I think at a practical level it might have that effect, whether that is directly related to party affiliation is a little bit different, but um, I just want to interject what the research has shown. And Mr. Kendall, is, is that your conclusion as well? Well, I, I, I hesitate to say how any particular race comes out because you know this will change who runs, um, I, I would imagine. Um, now, will it result in more independents or non-major uh, party candidates getting elected? Not necessarily, but it's going to create a path. The barriers will come down and they'll be on an equal playing field. And I will say in a world where there's a D and R and a super qualified independent, that independent is now not essentially hampered by the system by ha from having a chance. Now they're on an equal playing field. So I guess I would say if it's a good candidate, now they've got a path. Whereas now there often is no path unless they go off and they've made a deal with one of the two parties. Hey, stand aside so I can be the one because in, in three-way, four-way races, it's just sort of a race of who's the spoiler. Um, I will say most districts are gonna stay the same in terms of political complexion. Downtown Anchorage, uh, as far as I can see, they're gonna have some flavor of Democrat. Many districts in the Valley, they're obviously gonna have some flavor of Republican. But what's gonna be true is that whoever's elected is going to be more in line with the majority of their district as opposed to the voters being faced with, well, this is the lesser of two evils. And even though I hate everything that comes out of this guy's mouth, he's an R and that's a D and that's who I'm going with. Maybe there's gonna be a moderate R and independent that's just a little more to the public's liking. And if 50% plus one agree, then they're gonna select that person that's just more in line with their thinking. And what we see with the 62% in the middle is Alaskans do not live at the partisan polls. They just don't live there. We, if we see our neighbor broken down, we pull up and we help them with their car. We don't ask if they're an R or a D. It's just kind of how we live. And I think everyone on the call understands that. So I think what you end up with is more competitive races, a path for independence, and ultimate winners that are just more in line with the wishes of a majority of their electorate. All right. And on to wrap up here, Mr. Richards, I'd like to turn to you first with any closing thoughts you might have. Yeah, just to address that, I. I mean, I agree with Scott in the sense of is I, I have no idea how this is going to impact, you know, Republicans versus Democrat candidates. I do think it's going to result in a bunch of weird outcomes, um, a lot of weird outcomes over time, not in all the races, but some of them. And, and by that, I mean, you're going to end up with situations where, uh, you know, the traditional candidate that would have and should have won under the normal American voting system is going to get uh, they're going to get squeezed out, particularly when you have a situation where there's like two strong Democrats and one Republican. Um, it's going to be similar to, I think, what time, sometimes you see in the Anchorage mayor race or used to. Um, so that's on that point. And so I guess just the last point I would make here is that, uh, you know, certainly Mr. When, when Mr. Kendall wrote this bill that included a large Alaska component, it is 27 pages and addresses a lot of very Alaska-specific law, particularly around fi campaign finance disclosures. But the gravamen of the major pieces of the bill that we're talking about, those aren't Alaska written. 
Those are written out of state. You can see similar language in Maine. You can see similar language in North Dakota. It is the design. It is somebody's idea in the lower 48, a group of people who think America's political system isn't working the way they want it to work. So they want to redesign it and they've created a new system that's an arbitrary system, one that, that's got made up to essentially change our election outcomes. And it's being paid for by those out-of-state interests. It's being supported by those out-of-state interests. Um, in Alaska is, although $5 million is a whopping sum of money for them to spend in Alaska from our point of view, it's very small in the national stage. So the, the cheap states like North Dakota and Maine and Alaska are the guinea pigs for these billionaires that want to you know, implement their vision of how American voting should work. And it's fundamentally un-Alaskan. Um, it's not from here and we should reject it. Our, our system works well. It works fine. And it's our Alaska system designed by our legislature with our constitution in mind. And there's no reason to allow outsiders to redo our election law and what they think uh, you know, Alaska should look like. So that's why I would vote no. And Mr. Kendall. Yeah, and I don't wanna to go too far into the finances because I think this is a policy discussion, um, but Mr. Richards has kind of repeatedly gone there. So I'll, I'll point out that, you know, again, this, the no on two campaign is getting vast sums of money from the same players who play in our primary elections, who play in our general elections, who are spending right now. Um, and again, the no on two campaign are the same people who got sanctioned by the APOC for having wildly inaccurate APOX words disclosures. They didn't disclose who their real top three donors were. They disclosed three Alaskans who gave less than 1% of their money. So let's not talk about the finances because that's not a good look for the no on two crowd. But I will say, Mr. Richard keeps referring to this normal American voting system. Um, there's nothing in the US constitution about political parties, nothing in the Alaska constitution about political parties and certainly nothing about having a two party system and in fact, George Washington's farewell address was dedicated almost entirely to his concern that we would degenerate into two party system. John Adams wrote that the greatest possible evil threatening democracy was the, the two political parties becoming the most powerful elements in our political system. This is the where we have gotten to is is counter to where we should be in terms of democracy. So I guess I would close by saying folks should ask themselves if the status quo is working. Is it working on the economy? Is it working on the budget? Is it working on how we respond to a pandemic? Or is the party system, the political gridlock, what's getting in the way of solutions? Why has our election system put barriers between voters and their elected officials? That's what these are. That's what all these pieces, the parties being get, getting to be gatekeepers to the ballot, being able to swap out voters after they've already been approved in a primary and plug in a different, different candidate why do we give political parties that power? Why do they occupy that rarefied air when all power comes from the people? Why do we subsidize a party process for them to select their candidates? Why don't they go off in a convention and then tell the public, bear the burden of telling the public which candidates they support? 62% of Alaskans choose not to affiliate with either major party. And I would venture to guess that even those who, who affiliate with a major party, I would venture to guess many if not most of those Alaskans have voted contrary to their party affiliation from time to time. I think in Alaska, we know each other. I'm a Republican. I don't know if I've ever voted a perfectly straight party ticket in the state. That's the way it works and that's the way it should work. So let's give more power and choices to the voters. Let's tear down the barriers and let's see what, a, what the vision is of a majority of Alaskans for our state. And please do so by voting yes on two. And Mr. Fortson, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, I, I mean, I think that the, the initiative, if passed, would um, certainly increase the number of candidates that have a viable option, a uh, viable path to victory. Whether or not that is desirable is a question I think that voters have to decide. Um, do you want a situation where a candidate who um, under the current system would lose in a primary election then has sort of a second chance so to speak um now the current system is they would have to run within their party i think another thing to keep in mind is that again voter turnout is much higher in the general election than in primary elections i think that there arguably is a value to having more voters have access to more candidates and so a system where 
you might have four candidates that have proven themselves in the primary to be uh, so the four best choices, for lack of a better word. Um, having the voters have access and the opportunity to vote for those um, could be seen as a good thing. Again, you know, this might be at the detriment of political parties being able to choose their their candidates, and you know, that's the choice that we have to make with this ballot measure. Um, did you have anything that you wanted to, uh, James, that you wanted to say before I sort of wrap up the symposium as a whole? Yeah, I just wanted to thank our three panelists as well as the organizers of this event, the Alaska Law Review and the UAA Justice Center, Law Review Editor in Chief Cormac Bloomfield, Ryan Kuczynski. Uh, support for this conference from, came from the Alaska Bar Association and everyone else who helped with the production of the event. Yeah, and you sort of stole my words as far as who <laughs> I was going to thank for the symposium. I'd also thank uh, Professor Metzloff, uh, the faculty advisor for the Alaska Law Review. Um, and yes, Cormac uh, Bloomfield has been uh, working tirelessly behind the scenes to put all this together. Ryan Kaczynski has done all the technical setup. Um, Brendan McGuire has also been involved in getting this symposium organized. And I think it's very gratifying, you know, I've been involved in the, these symposiums for eight years, I think, four of them. Um, and we've always had great turnout. And I think it's just a wonderful reflection of the interest, at least within the legal community. And I don't know how many people are watching this on YouTube, but a wonderful reflection of the interest in democracy and the interest in um, having the best system that we can have, regardless of what your position is ultimately on ballot measure two or on any of the initiative process or the other issues that were discussed earlier. Um, I think one of the best indicators of a healthy democracy is the interest that citizens have in seeing democracy survive. And you know, based on the attendance here today at the symposium, my hope is that Alaska is in good hands. And so with that, I'll just say thank you to everyone for participating. I know there are a lot of questions we weren't able to get to. I apologize for that. Um, we have a limited time, but um, it's been an excellent discussion and I hope you all benefited from it. Thank you. And with that, I think we will probably, I'll leave it up to Cormac, but I think we'll probably just sign off. That's it. Thank you. You guys can sign off and have a restful weekend. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.